discuss more about this brave new world of RNA modification. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for the, the intro and uh, kind words. Super happy to be here and I will share my screen and we can uh, get started. Cool. So today, as mentioned, I'll talk a little bit about the glycoRNA work and sort of the concept of uh, trying to bridge these two, um, these two fields, glycobiology and RNA biology. And hopefully there will be more in this vein. And I think that the, the glycoRNAs are just one example of, of, this, uh, of this interface that's not yet well studied. So um, I'll, try to, I'll try to keep the talk a little bit short so there's more time for discussion because a lot of the work, again, was just recently published. But um, just to hear the, hear the story, um, I wanted to kind of start by thinking about uh, the way I look at biology and often it's from an RNA perspective. And I think that um, I have the view and I hope I can convince many here that RNA really is a key regulator of biology. There are a number of examples that I'll show here, including for example, the spliceosome, the ribosome and riboswitches, which are sort of fundamental aspects of biology across kingdoms. But what I think is very interesting is that they are themselves RNA machines that work on RNA. And so RNA gets spliced by RNA and it is the template for splicing. You know, tRNAs bring in the amino acids which decode the mRNA, which are then the things, the proteins are polymerized by a RNA machine. So I think it's, there, there's, there's RNA everywhere and it does all of these really cool things. And so in that context, um, you sort of wonder where do people study RNA biology? And one way to think about that is physically where is RNA? And I study mostly mammalian cells. So this is a, a cartoon of what a mammalian cell might look like in, in some way. And of course, RNA comes from the nucleus. And so it exists in the nucleus and it goes to the cytosol and does things like get translated and be degraded and, and otherwise regulated. And RNA also actually exists on membranes. So there's um, membrane translation at the plasma membrane, at the ER membrane. And there's other RNA biology that occurs uh, on different uh, cellular membranes. But what I sort of came to realize as I was uh, thinking through my postdoc and working in a glycobiology lab was that there's pretty little information, uh, plus or minus <laughs> this, uh, this occurring about RNA being in membranes, in the luminal spaces, of organelles like the ER or Golgi. And we're gonna separate out the mitochondria for the moment. We're, we're not thinking about that in this context of luminal, lumin, luminally enclo enclosed uh, organelles. So uh, to, to kind of put a better handle on this and start to think about how we could actually address if this was a thing that could happen, could RNA be inside the membranes? I needed to know and think through what were these organelles doing and what would be common features potentially to explore um, uh, sort of common functional features between uh, all these organelles. And it turns out that they're really um, uh, well evolved and, and specialized for thinking about glycans, these carbohydrate polymers, which we just heard a little bit about. Um, and, and so I'll, I, I will also get in a little bit what are glycans, but the, the general idea is that there are another biopolymer um, that can be conjugated when, uh, to proteins and lipids. And so you get these glycoproteins and glycolipid uh, conjugates, glycoconjugates, they're, they're concentrated, formed, uh, remodeled, and trafficked through these uh, luminal um, and, and membrane-enclosed spaces like the Golgi and ER and endosomes. But um, you know, just for, for review, and because it'll be important for the ways we think about the glycoRNA, um, you know, what are glycans and, and what sort of why are they special? So this isn't a sort of a chemical, um, uh, drawing of what one monosaccharide called sialic acid looks like. The sort of abbreviated name is nu 5 ac and we abbreviated even further with uh, colored shapes because as you'll see here, they can become very complex. And so you can get a number of configurations and combinations of these colored shapes and they can be put on, like I said, um, proteins or lipid templates. And as cartooned here, most of the glyco uh, mass, most of these carbohydrates exist in the extracellular space or the luminal compartments of these organelles. 
And they're, uh, you know, like, like I'm showing here, just a very small subset of, of configurations and, and conjugate types, but they uh, perform a, a hugely uh, large number of important functions. And I'll list a tiny part of that here, including membrane biophysics, cell-cell interactions, host pathogen regulation, and immune regulation. And so uh, I, I became very quickly excited about the idea of glycans as regulators of biology um, and, and things that could be regulated by biology. And I, I kind of realized though that we, we hadn't been thinking, I had never been thinking about glycans um, in the context of my RNA biology sort of historical work. And so I, I wondered if we could come back to this paradigm of um, glycans finding lipids and proteins and then being conjugated to them in the luminal space um, and, and wonder what would happen if RNA was there. And, and this would solve a few of the questions and problems we were thinking about which would be, is RNA in a luminal space? Could it get a glycan? And, and, the, and, and so we, we sort of try, needed to think about a way to ask this question um, sort of very carefully, and then uh, potentially in a fairly agnostic way. We didn't want to be restricted to um, only seeing one kind of uh, outcome. We wanted to make sure we could see it if it was actually happening. And so we thought we would take um, a chemical approach in particular using metabolic reporters. So these are common reagents now, and in the RNA world, we use uh, 5 ethanolurethane to, to label RNAs. Um, proteins can be labeled with amino acid reporters like l homoalanine And the kind of key here is that they incorporate um, uh, bioorthogonal handles like alkynes or azides, which can then be later detected with uh, these very highly selective and efficient uh, chemistry. And uh, you know, super convenient for me, uh, my, my postdoc uh, advisor, Carolyn Bertozzi, had um, sort of developed this idea of bioorthogonal chemistry and really pioneered it into uh, learning about glycobiology. And one of the main tools that she developed and, and I, I used in this work is this uh, peracetylated man-NAS. And so uh, we, we can treat cells with this man-NAS, it goes into the cells and gets converted into that sialic acid uh, sugar that I mentioned earlier. In this case, it's new 5 as because the acetyl group was is converted into um, a uh, an azide at the end here. So I'm going to highlight that here. And and what this what this lets us do is look in any glycan that would contain a sialic acid, which is many types of glycans, and we could we could uh, again detect it with some uh, click click handle and then ask a question. And and the question we were going to ask was. Uh, do, does this ever label the RNA component of a cell? So these azido reporters, these azido sugars have been used to look at the lipid components of cells or the compartments of cells, the protein compartments of cells. But it just turned out that no one asked this other question, which was, is, there, is, the, is this existing in the RNA component or RNA compartment? So we did the very standard experiment where you treat cells with an azido sugar like um, MANAC or MANAS, uh, we extracted RNA, we did a bunch of digestions, uh, had pure RNA, and then reacted it with a, with a, uh, a copper-free biotin, a co copper-free click biotin reagent, and asked, do we see any signal? Could we run this out on a gel and detect this with a streptavidin reagent? And sort of to our uh, sort of delight, after a number of optimization steps in terms of the blotting and the, the labeling efficiencies, um, we could get gels that look like this, where um, on the bottom is the sort of a, a loaded control and shows that we can recover RNA and it's intact if we don't destroy it with RNase, which is the third lane. And in, this, in the lanes where we either don't treat the cells with anything or add DNase, which is you know, not going to chop up RNA, we see this really nice band in the high molecular weight region that stains positive with a streptavidin reagent, suggesting that there was biotin there and the biotin came from clicking to the azide. And again, the azide came from a sugar, from a glyco, uh, like a monosaccharide labeling. So this was very interesting. And we could recover this signal with, with a nuclease inhibitor, which I thought was pretty important because RNases uh, can be, the preps can be fairly dirty. And we wanted to make sure that what we were seeing was really specific to the actual activity, the endonuclease activity of RNase in this case. And so we started calling this thing glycoRNA at this point where we had a bit more uh, comfort around the, the labeling and what we were seeing and started to think about what were we actually looking at? What types of RNAs were we, were we visualizing in this gel? And so 
if you look at the ladder on the left of this gel, it's, it's much higher than nine KB. So I thought this is gonna be a long RNA. And it turns out that if you separate out all of the RNAs in the cell by density centrifugation, run them in the gel and transfer them and do this glycoRNA labeling and detection, we got the opposite answer. So it seems like all of the glyco signal uh, up here on the top left is migrating by density, so by mass, um, with the small RNAs. So this was a pretty big surprise to me. I thought this was going to be a long polyenylated non-coding RNA, but I was totally wrong about that. So we uh, use this type of purification strategy to pull down. This is a biotin that we're detecting, so we can pull it down rather than using imaging and just do sequencing. So we moved to a sequencing experiment where we wanted to investigate two different cell types and two different cell conditions. So HeLa cells are cancer. These ES cells are sort of more primary and they're, they have different you know, capacities and cell states. And we thought this is gonna be a very cool comparison. Along those lines, they, they labeled dramatically differently with the MAN-NAS reporter where you can see the ES cells have maybe 10 or, or 50 times more labeling. And when we pulled down the biotin and we sequenced the RNAs that we got back, and we looked at the enrichments for which RNAs were enriched for, for the glyco mark, um, we found that a select group of small RNAs were modified. And what was particularly fascinating was when we looked at the um, enriched RNAs from HeLa cells on the y-axis and the enriched RNAs from the H9 cells on the x-axis, we see a diagonal line, which suggested to us that the somehow these cells are selecting actually in a quantitative manner the same transcripts. So if you're a glycoRNA in human ES cells, you're also a glycoRNA in HeLa cells. The exceptions here were RNAs that are not expressed in HeLa cells, which are along the x-axis. And these were some imprinted snow RNAs that again, are, are just at the genomic level turned off in the HeLa cells. So this was uh, pretty exciting. And again, suggested that we've, we found a, a class of Y-RNAs, SNRNAs, SNORNAs, and, and tRNAs, which I didn't show in that plot, that are enriched and ro robustly enriched and sort of consistently enriched across cell type. But the way we discovered what those RNAs were was by pulling on a glycan. And so the question now is, what glycans were we actually using as our anchor, as our selection method? And in uh, some data that I won't show, we kind of narrowed initially our, our search space down from O or N glycans just to N glycans, because we think it, the, the, the signal we were seeing is coming from N glycans. So we did some um, in-cell uh, inhibitor work where we could selectively inhibit different paths, different parts of the N glycosylation biosynthesis pathway and ask what happens to the glycoRNA signal. So if we inhibit the very first step of N glycosylation, we get robust loss um, of the glycoRNA signal. And if we go to inhibit later steps uh, of, of enzymes, either alpha monosidase one or alpha monosidase two, we see a similar loss of glycoRNA signal. But what was interesting in the streptavidin blots is you can see lower signal as we increase the dose of the compound, but also changes in the molecular weight. And the monosidases actually reconfigure the structure of the glycan that is attached to the glycoconjugate. And so this suggests that the molecular weight that we're seeing is actually really robustly controlled by the configuration or the composition of the glycans that are, are attached to it. And so to get a bit higher resolution and better understanding of what was going on, we uh, optimized a, a glycan release assay where we could take RNA, release the end glycans, and then do LCMS analysis of this. And when we compared the um, composition, of the RNA-released glycans from the peptide-released glycans of the same cells, it was pretty interesting that the RNA glycans were more similar to each other, even across a diverse cell, cell types, whereas the peptide glycans were more similar to each other and sort of spread away from, from the RNA. So in the brown is peptide and in the blue is RNA. And what we thought was additionally interesting was the amount of fucose in red and the amount of sialic acid in purple was more usually in the RNA samples than in the peptide released samples. And fucose and sialic acid are interesting for us because they're highly regulatory and they're regulated. And so this suggested that if we build out a slightly more interesting looking model of what a glycoRNA could look like, we, we get these highly decorated, highly complex glycans that are attached to the RNAs. And, and this points us a little bit to think about what they could actually 
do and what could they bind? Um, and I'll get back to that in a second, but one of the sort of, I think, major outstanding questions for us was where is all of this happening? Where are these localized? Where are they going? And I think the reason why we were so curious about this is because where things are can really inform their function. So we wanted to know where these were and we thought maybe the glycan is driving some of its function and or some of its localization. And so we thought, where are other glycoconjugates and where do other glycoconjugates go? The answer is of course, they're secreted and they go to the cell surface. And so we thought we should try to see um, if that, that was happening with these, with these glycoconjugates. So we repeated that very first experiment where we just treated cells with mannaz and collected RNA, but in the middle, we treated the cells with sialidase to cut up any sialic acids that are on the cell surface of living cells. Then we washed everything away and extracted the RNA. And the idea was if, if it was accessible, if the RNA was actually out there and accessible to the media and accessible to the, the sialidase while the cells were alive, we'd reduce the signal that we would get when we performed this experiment. And that's exactly what we saw. And what, you know, so from this blot is an, an, is an end of one example, but when we did this across a number of cell types, adherent and suspension cells, um, we could see that there was always a really robust loss of glycorna signal if we treated the living cells with sialidase. Some of them lost 50%, some of them lost 80%. So it meant that not only was it accessible to the cell surface, but that much of the signal we had been seeing this whole time was actually on the surface. And so the last kind of piece that I want to connect here is again, what could they be doing and how did those glyco uh, glycocompositions and putative structures inform us and, uh, and, and sort of start to steer us towards a, a potential function. And I mentioned uh, sialic acid and we've been using mannaz this whole time. And so what, what do cells, how do cells, how does the body recognize and regulate sialic acid? And there's a, in, in humans, there's a very large uh, family of proteins called Siglec receptors. And they are uh, really uh, specifically expressed on a series of immune um, uh, cells. So there's about 15 different family members. They're cartooned here. And in, in really importantly, there are these Pac-Man-like domains at the end of each of these proteins. And the Pac-Mans bind the, the glyco uh, space, and in particular, sialic acid. And then they can communicate through signal transduction into the cell. And so that's so the reason why this is so interesting and has become very clinically relevant is because um, normally, or, or in many cases, cell surface proteins read the protein space, and then they can either bind or block or signal. Siglec receptors read the glycospace, so they see what carbohydrates are in the body, and then they do those same things, signaling, blocking, or binding. And so they work through checkpoint inhibi inhibition, like, like PD-1 same types of intracellular domains are present on the Siglex. And so what we could do is take uh, recombinant versions of most of these proteins and bind them to cells and ask if this binding uh, occurs, is it ever related to RNA? And so we could use a nuclease to try to chop up the RNA and ask, do any of these Siglex bind more weakly? And what we found was that actually the majority of the Siglex in the case of HeLa cells bound, and they bound like this first one in green, Siglex 7, where they had really robust binding, and then nothing happened when we added RNAs. But what was very exciting for us was that actually two of these, Siglex 11 and Siglex 14, both bound to the cells very reproducibly and had substantial reduction in those binding when we treated the cells, the living cells, with RNAs, which suggested that at least some of the ligands for these Siglec receptors, in particular 11 and 14, could be cell surface glycoRNAs. And so just to summarize the, the kind of high level idea here is that we have a series, a select group of small non-coding RNAs that seem to be um, in their identity, they're, they're highly conserved, highly abundant, and, and selected for this modification. We find that there are these highly sialylated and fucosylated and glycans that are, that are appended to the RNA. And in work that I didn't show, it may be the case that there are a sialo or, or, or glycans without sialic acid that are also coupled to the, the RNAs, but the MANAS does not let us uh, interrogate that and uh, you know, future work will we'll start to look into that. Um, I also uh, very briefly, but 
you know, just to highlight that the scope of this is, is quite broad. So we've seen glycoRNAs in human cells, uh, hamster cells, mouse cells, and in vivo mouse. And we've also moved into zebrafish and have, have seen this, uh, have seen evidence of this um, conjugate in zebrafish. So many places where sialic acid exists, we can detect this, um, detect this conjugate. And lastly, there's this sort of uh, building um, uh, evidence of, of cell surface presentation and, and exposure to the sort of extracellular environment where there are a lot of ideas of what it could be doing sort of more functionally. So I'll just end briefly with uh, some acknowledgements. I really wanna thank Carolyn Bertozzi, my postdoc mentor who um, gave me the space, but then also guidance to kind of think through and, and complete this work in the lab. Um, the people in the little diamond on the top are, are the people in the lab and at Stanford that really helped uh, complete the work during my postdoc. And um, now we started the Flynn Lab, uh, like mentioned at the Children's Hospital here in Boston. Um, these, are the, these are the lab members and we're all sort of focused on understanding the, the interface of uh, you know, glycobiology and RNA biology. So um, yeah, thanks, thanks for the attention and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for your talk again. It was really fantastic. The, the amount of uh, avenues that you opened with your study, it's just amazing. So we already have a question and it's coming from Skri uh, Ram. And I'm sorry again, if I'm mispronouncing your name. And it says, fantastic work. What is the health love of these glycoRNAs since RNA are not so stable like proteins and lipids? And the second question he's also asking also, uh, as we know, uh, and glycans binds to protein through uh, amine bonds on aspartame and residues. So where does the end glycan moiety binds to the RNAs? Yeah, those are great questions. So we're still working on the dynamics. I'll say that um, while it's a commonly held belief that proteins and lipids are very stable, there are cell surface proteases, lipids are turned over very rapidly. Um, there's a lot of dynamics going on all the time. And it is true, again, of course, there are nucleases outside of the cell and inside of the cell, but there are proteases everywhere as well. So I think that the idea that RNA is ultra labile is something that people have because they're scared of RNAs on their bench. Um, and, you know, <laughs> uh, that's just a, 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 a feature that we always think about. Um, but I think that the, the, that figuring out the dynamics is gonna require a lot of new tool building. So the, the, whole, the whole paper essentially was building a method after a method after a method to actually see this. So that just takes a long time. <laughs> and, and a lot of it is optimizing the chemistry for going from proteins to RNA, which is very irritating. But if anyone has any good ideas on how to look at these things in a dynamic or like, you know, uh, real time manner, uh, more than welcome to try or, or, or help advise or whatever. Um, and then the, the point on the, the connection is critical and really interesting. Um, we're, we're working on sort of a number of threads to figure out what is the actual connection, right? So, um, you know, is there one atom or 10 atoms? Um, is it on the base or the ribose? Uh, what is this, what, how does the glycan look? Is there some other modification on the glycan side that helps that performs this? Um, but but it's it's uh, it is currently unknown. Um, my my I would say maybe my current hypothesis is that it is not likely that a natural base gets modified. I think that the base is is either damaged. So I, first of all, I think it's on the base. That's my my guess. And I think that the base is either damaged or in some other way modified as a signal to then become uh, a template for glycosylation. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, uh, proving any of what I just said will take time, but that's where, that's where we're thinking about. Fair. Uh, then there's a question that I was also wondering from to see you. Um, and first of all, everybody's saying great talk, so brilliant uh, from the crowd as well. And the question is, uh, what does the disruption of glycoRNA interfere with transcription? So what is the physiology that you can foresee? Yeah, I mean, I would expect that 
the glycan, the glycan appears to inhibit reverse transcriptase in our sequencing experiments. And so my guess would be that it'd be pretty disruptive to the translational machinery or transcriptional machinery. However, um, first of all, these are on small RNAs. And so they're not particularly well uh, translated. And I think that the, you know, our, our current hypothesis, our current model is that when these RNAs become modified, they are no longer in the topological space to be translated. Mm -hmm. They are in the luminal spaces. Active ribosomes are not found in the luminal spaces. And so I think that there is a totally orthogonal set of functions for the same transcript when it has or does not have a glycan. Yeah. And I was also wondering, have you considering doing the same experiment in a DICER knockout cell line, or what do you think this would happen? Um, we never saw any microRNA pre, pri, or mature come up okay. in the sequencing. Um, would be happy to look uh, if anyone wants to send cells or, or RNA. Um, I would. I would guess it's either not a primary effect if there's a change or there's a secondary effect because you mess up microRNAs and then you change regulation of many things in the cell. And then this is a con there's a consequence somewhere along the path of disrupted microRNA homeostasis. But uh, I always like to look. Um, so, you know, I can't, I, I don't know formally what the, what the outcome would be. Thank you. Then from uh, Jack Lee. A fantastic talk. Can RNAs directly interact with lipid membrane? And second question, do enrich small RNAs have any con consensus sequence? Um, uh, there, there was a bioarchive um, paper that came out maybe a few weeks before our paper was published. And they describe, they describe uh, f features and, and examples of RNA sequences interacting with lipid membranes. And I've talked to this group and we're thinking through that a bit. Um, it's not my area of expertise. And so I don't have a high de degree of understanding of, of how that works and what are the sort of biophysical parameters around that, but it is possible. Um, it's, it seems like there's data that suggests that RNA can directly interface with lipid membranes. Um, and then the question will be like these, is it, is it these transcripts? Is it not these transcripts? Is it the plasma membrane versus other membranes? And like getting into all those details will, will take some time. But um, that's a question that I hadn't thought about before this bioarchive paper and, and is, is, is poss I think is possible. Um, what was the second question? The second question is, is there any consensus sequence? Uh, um, uh, there, I think there probably is. I, I didn't find one. I've been I've been like consistently bad at finding primary sequence motifs in RNA sequencing experiments that I've done pretty much throughout the course of my PhD and postdoc. So um, what I could see was that the modifications always occurred at a G and in the small RNA sequences, those Gs were always in single stranded loops or bulges of a structure. Mm -hmm. So they were, they were always putatively single-stranded bases, but I'm really bad with Homer or whatever other tool people use to like meme to like find motifs. And so um, uh, I don't know, but, but the data exists, just search it if you're good at that. And you'll, I'm sure you'll find something if it's there. Great. And there's a question from uh, Abrin Oliveris and he's asking, how do RNAs get fixed into the cell membrane? Is there a direct interaction with lipid membrane or might be themselves be lipidated? And have you seen uh, if the amount of glycorNAs change through different conditions like stress, cell death? And then I have a question that you showed that in HELAS, if you compare to ES cells, there is a difference. And I was wondering, is there, um, like, do you see more glycorNAs in more pluripotent cells like in HACs, ESCs, and when you decrease the transcription entropy, you see a decrease in glycoRNAs as well? Yeah. So how, how this interfaces with the membrane is a very broad question, but could have, and there are many models, 
you can have direct RNA lipid interaction. You can get a lipidated RNA that inserts. You could have an RNA binding protein or a moonlighting RNA binding protein bind it, and that holds it. Or you could have the glycan bind a glycoreceptor, and then the RNA is sticking out. I drew it one way, <laughs> and it could be the opposite way. So those are all models, right? Um, we're thinking about all of them. Some of them may be more or less likely, but there are lots of ways and configurations, physical configurations that they could abut the membrane. Um, we haven't extensively characterized just because there are like a hundred thousand things to try, but there, there, we haven't extensively characterized or, or, you know, investigated all of the states and all of the cell conditions. Um, one thing that I can say that I've seen more recently is, for example, cell density matters a lot. So if you grow cells very densely, this is at least with cancer cells. So, you know, I'll say this and then it'll be not true, but for like HeLa cells and 2 3 cells and other, other more common cell lines, when the cells are very, very dense, there's less glycoRNA. And when the cells are 50% confluent or, you know, there's a little bit of space, there's more glycoRNA per cell. So I did that experiment sort of on purpose because it made sense to me that if it was on the membrane, maybe when they're touching or not touching, something could be different. And that was true. Uh, how is this regulated and why is that the case? I don't know any of those questions. I don't know any of the answers to those questions yet. Um, and, then, and then I think, uh, you know, the last question about the difference between the HeLa and, and ESC and, and, and how does it look in pluripotency? I'm interested in thinking about that, but what, what was sort of... Uh, you know, exciting and then disappointing and then interesting was uh, we saw these differences. And in the paper, we have many more comparisons with the man as reporter. Um, and then we started to do uh, assessment of sialic acid in the RNA without labels. So no man as. Mm -hmm. And if you quantify HeLa to HTSC, it's probably 50 times more by man as reporter. If you quantify just the total amount of sialic acid that you get from RNA from HeLa or HESC, it's like four times more. And so the thing you have to be careful about with the reporters is they are themselves secondary, like secondary, you know, messengers or reporters basically. So you add it to the media at some rate, it gets into the cell at some rate, it gets all the acetyl groups get removed at some rate, it gets converted into sialic acid and incorporated. And then the different types of glycans that that cell has will be more or less competent for including the cyanase. And then there's some dynamics, right? Then, then it's like, how quickly are those proteins getting turned over? Or those RNAs getting turned over? And that might be different given the cell context. And so the dramatic difference between HeLa and ESC labeling with MANAS was more, I think, a metabolic flux or a, a network effect of how it's using MANAS rather than truly that difference. Although, again, with the unlabeled strategy, there was a lot more, like a lot more, like four or five times more sialic acid on RNA um, in the ES cells than in the HeLa cells. But I think what we have to start doing is moving away from or using many types of tools to investigate the same conditions. And so we know what's the ground truth and that it's not like a labeling issue uh, or, or a technical feature of the labeling rather than uh, like a true amount of difference. Mm -hmm. But yeah, again, tool building is kind of the underlying okay, cool. structure there. Fair. Uh, I think just for the sake of time, we have to go more to questions. So we have a question for Jennifer Parat, and she says, great talk. Does the glycan impact nuclease uh, sensitivity, either through blocking nucleases or altering RNA structure? Yeah, so, um, you know, in short, we can't assess that directly yet because we can't make a synthetic glycoRNA. Um, however, if you were to block accessible single-stranded bases of a loop, it would be necessarily less accessible to endonucleases. So I think it's a very reasonable hypothesis to have that a, any type of modification, including a 2-kilodalton glycan would be, uh, or in particular a 2-kilodalton glycan, would be uh, stabilizing for the RNA, but we're, we're, we're working on sort of really careful ways to measure that, but, um, challenging yet before we can make them synthetically. Thank you so much for all your answers. Uh, it's a pity that I, I was not able to read them all. There are some other uh, questions here in the chat. Uh, if you don't mind, I will email 
them to you and then try to find these people afterwards and come back to, to the answers. Uh, once again, thank you both for, for the brilliant talks. They, they were fantastic. Thank you, Eugenia, for organizing this uh, symposium. I think we all learned a lot today. And yes, it was a great pleasure to moderate uh, this session today. Thank you again. Thanks. Thank you very much. And uh, you can follow our in our social network to keep on, on following our um, future seminars. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Thank you. Gisela, thank you, Ryan. It was a great uh, webinar. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.